Good afternoon. We'll call to order the meeting of the Johnson County Community College Board of Trustees for July 2017. Uh, help me open the meeting by honoring our country and saying our Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. The next item on the agenda is roll call and recognition <coughs> of visitors. Ms. Schlees. Thanks. This evening's visitors include Roberta Eveslage and James Pfeiffer. Welcome. Uh, the next item on the agenda is our open forum. The open forum section is an opportunity for members of the public to address the board and provide comments. There will be one open forum session during each regularly scheduled uh, meeting of the board. Comments are limited to five minutes unless they're are a large number of speakers, in which case the chair has the discretion to shorten that time frame. In order to be recognized, a member, a, a commentor my, must sign in at the door uh, prior to the open forum session. Uh, when addressing the board, registered speakers are expected to remain at the podium, should be respectful, and are encouraged to address any individual personnel or student uh, matters directly with the appropriate college personnel. As a matter of practice, the college does not respond in this setting when matters concern personnel or student matters or matters that are being addressed through our established grievance procedures or otherwise uh, through the board's policies. Uh, we have nobody who has signed up this evening uh, for the open comment or open forum period. Uh, we do have a, an award and recognition. Uh, Dr. Sopcich. Um, thank you, Trustee Musil. I'd like to ask Karen Martley to come to the podium. Karen is our Vice President of Continuing Education and Organizational Development. Karen. Thanks, Joe. Uh, well, tonight it's my honor to recognize a team here that worked on a project and was awarded a national award this past March of 2017 at a conference. So if you all would come up, I'm going to have you introduce yourself in just a minute. And we are missing a few of the team members tonight. I'll acknowledge who those are in a minute. This group uh, was recognized by the Chair Academy, which is a national leadership development organization that we have a number of our employees go through. It's a year-long co cohort. And each year they give awards for exemplary leadership and exemplary team leadership. And this is our college employee engagement team, excluding a few of the members, which um, Marilee Nicholson is uh, not able to be here tonight, Elisa Waldman, Kim Manifold, and Jason. Di Jason. Jason may be here. I think he's actually working and running back and forth. And Diana. And, and Diana, Rotting House. And um, so anyway, they were recognized for their work in not only uh, implementing the first employee engagement survey, they did all the research, they did the RFPs, they met with the vendors, and then they've been responsible for the second implementation of the survey. And I will tell you, talk about engagement, uh, they are from all over campus working together. They put out weekly information for us as managers to look at as tips to utilize, and they've just been a really good sounding board and committee that um, I've really enjoyed working with over the last uh, few years, and quite frankly, keep me accountable for a lot of things along the way too. So I'm going to let each one of them receive an award at the conference. So I've, we've just brought one of those tonight, but each one of the team members actually received an award with their name on it from the uh, academy as well too. So I'm going to let each one of you introduce yourself and say what you do and what area you work in. Do you want to start? Okay, sure. Hi, I'm Debbie Eisenhower, Staff and Organizational Development. And um, the group that I have the honor to uh, help um, with their engagement um, strategy and um, you know their look at themselves with regards to employee engagement would be full-time and part-time faculty and staff and then also work with our full-time faculty through our Leadership Institute program. So it's been a journey. Thank you. I'm Donna Duffy. I'm on a full-time faculty member out here. Um, so and I am <clears throat> in the entrepreneurship area. I'm Kathy Wing. I work in Human Resources, Compensation, and HRIS Manager. I'm Keith Davenport. I'm the Manager of Student Activities and Leadership Development. I manage the Student Welcome Desk on the first floor of the Student Center and supervise a team of Student Activities Ambassadors. So again, congratulations to all of you. Uh, I'm just so proud of all the work you've been able to accomplish over the last couple of years. Thank you. Good 
Mr. Chairman, can we just add Karen and her team to the agenda every month? <laughs> Is there, you guys are always getting awards. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you. That's, that's, that's an important part of our strategic plan, um, and it's great to have people that do such a great job and they're recognized externally for that. So thank you, Karen. Uh, we have no college lobbyist report today as Mr. Carter is unable to attend. So we'll move into committee reports. Uh, Trustee Ingram. Yes. Um, Human Resources. Sorry. Human Resources did not meet this month, but we will meet again on August the 7th at 9.30 a.m. Thank you. Uh, Trustee Cross, Learning Quality. Uh, Mr. Chair, Learning Quality Committee did not meet this month. We'll meet again next month. Is it summer recess or something? Must be. Must be. All right, Management Committee always finds something to do. Trustee Cook. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, while I was not here for the management meeting, <laughs> uh, the Management That's Committee did meet, that. and I would defer to uh, Trustee Lindstrom for the report. Thank you, Trustee Cook. Uh, Mr. Chairman, the Management Committee met on uh, Wednesday, July 5th uh, at 8 a.m. here in the boardroom. The information related to our meeting, it begins on page one and runs through page 16 of the board packet. Uh, the management committee received several presentations, including an update from the uh, facilities master plan from BNIM Architects. And at this time, I'd like to ask Rex Hayes, Associate Vice President for Campus Services and Facilities <coughs> Planning, to introduce our speaker and update the, uh, update the board. Rex. Thank you, Trustee Lindstrom. Uh, but before I introduce James Pfeiffer, I want to recount uh, how we got to where we are today concerning the facilities master plan. As you recall, in December 2015, the college hired Smith Group JJR to perform a comprehensive master plan. And in October of 2016, the board approved recommendations from the facility master plan. So in April 20, uh, this year, 2017, we hired BNIM to execute the design of those recommendations. And, and that's phase one that, that they are doing. And phase one includes the construction of two new buildings, the Arts and Design Building, the Career and Technical Education Building, and then renovation of ATB and renovation and expansion of WLB. So BNIM, they've been very busy working since April of this year. And uh, James Pfeiffer, principal of BNIM, is here to give us an update and tell us where we are at today. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you all Do very good much. Job. Do a good job. <laughs> uh -oh. <laughs> well, good evening, everyone. Uh, as Rex mentioned, I'm, I'm James Pfeiffer. I'm a principal in architecture at <coughs> BNIM. I'm delighted to be here this evening uh, with you. And uh, you know, it it uh, it takes a team to do these kinds of projects, um, and uh, to do any project, frankly. And uh, so, I want to start off by just mentioning who our team is. So we're, we we have BNIM, uh, the Clark Anderson Partners as well, who is on our team, uh, SK Design, and then um, JE Dunn is uh, our construction manager. And so we've we've got a great team. And as Rex mentioned, you know we've 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 done a lot of work since uh, April of this year, and. And, and my job tonight is to give you guys a little bit of an update and a snapshot of what's been happening. So thanks again. So, you know, we always start off with, with this. Um, you know, we always start off with this, with the Gantt, with the Gantt, the Gantt chart of the Gantt schedule that's on the screen, and, and you can see the red line, and this is kind of where we're at in this process. And so everything on the, the left side of the line is things that are in the past, and everything on the right is, are things that are in the future, all the activities that are in the future. And you can see that we're really, in the big scheme of things, still pretty early on in this process. Um, we have completed um, schematic design um, for um, the CTE project and the arts and design project. And we um, have completed conceptual design for the ATB and the WLB buildings, 100%. So um, we are in a pricing exercise right now with JE Dunn. They're going through all the drawings and the, spec the, the narratives and all the information that we've given them after this process um, of engagement that we've had up until this point. The other thing we always start with um, in pretty much any presentation or any almost any discussion, frankly, are the mission, vision, and values of this particular institution. Um, they have underpinned our activities to date. They are critically important, and they'll continue to drive and influence us as we move forward. 
The process to date, we've, we've in addition to schematic design, we've, we've been engaged in really deep programming uh, session. And so these, these activities have been happening in parallel. And really programming is primarily about listening and collecting. Uh, we've been doing a lot of that with your faculty, your staff, your students. Um, it has been a really, really good, engaging process. And as it says on the screen, we've had over 250 hours with those groups. And we've learned a lot of information. And that information is being put into um, all the work that we are doing to date. In addition to that, we've done uh, a number of visits, a number of site visits to other institutions, other colleges. And we've, we've gotten more information and, and uh, intel in doing that. Jane, well, I see a lot of community colleges up there. Why the University of Iowa? Yeah, so the University of Iowa, we, uh, BNIM completed a project um, for their visual arts building there. And so we thought that was a real good opportunity to, to, to walk through that building and really learn some lessons. It's not a perfect uh, analogous project. It's a little bit bigger than ours, and some of the programs are a little bit different. But yeah, we thought is. that would be a really good uh, case study. For yeah, we like to compare ourselves to Big Ten school, so that's good. Exactly. Yeah. I, 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 think that's, I think that's fair. So I think that's fair. I think, I think we compare pretty favorably, actually. We do, I, actually. Yeah, yeah, I would say. So. Um, for, as Rex mentioned, four, four new projects. The two that I'm really going to speak to the most this evening are uh, the, the, the dots that are in green on the screen. The other two are the projects ATB and WLB. Um, ATB is, is really a renovation for combined welding, grounds, um, transportation, and other uses. WLB will be reconfigured for BNSF um, specialty labs. So let's, let's start with the arts and design building. Um, you know, going back to that programming process, you know, uh, we go through a visioning process and we ask everyone really to identify what is, what, what's going to make this project successful? And these were some of the items that really came out of that and really came to the top of, of the pile. So the, the building, first and foremost, has to really work well. It has to be functional. But it also has to be a place that's joyful and a place we want to go to every day. It's got to be inspiring for faculty, staff, students, visitors, um, everybody who engages it. It's got to be a building that connects people. Um, that's really, really important. Um, it needs to really enhance and complete the arts district that's already started on the east side of campus. There's a lot of really good momentum that's happening on the east side. This project needs to really um, enhance and complete that, that activity. Uh, it needs to promote collaboration between people, right? It needs to, it needs to bring out our best. Uh, it needs to support the various scales of work that happen in these programs. And as we've learned in talking with the, the faculty and students, they do a lot of different kinds of work. It's really impressive. They're really proud of it, and they want to showcase and support that work. And again, it wants to be extremely transparent. Um, you know, over the years, I think, and we've seen this in some of the projects here, more and more showcasing, showing what's happening, really helps to us to connect with one another. These are the various programs that are going to be in this building. So we, we're looking at art history currently with the fine arts program as well, with photography and filmmaking, sculpture, ceramics, metalsmithing, drawing and painting, and then finally the graphic design program. So when we began the process, it, you know, there's always this issue of where, where does the building really want to be? Uh, and it's, it's not an easy, this is not an easy site. And I think, as you're going to see, with, there's, it's a really uh, different kind of uh, situation relative to the CTE building, which we're going to talk to in a second. But I think where we've placed the building um, really, it does a few things. First of all, it uh, takes a, a really large space uh, between Rainier and HCA, as you can see on the screen. And it starts to break the scale of that space down. What we learn in talking and observing is that the space that's currently there is simply not used. And so what, how can this building not only provide all the great programs that we want, but also create great spaces around itself to really support the students, the faculty, and their work? And so what we think is by placing the building in this location slightly to the northwest of HCA, it does a few things. First of all, it breaks down the scale of that space into intimately sized spaces for people to use. Um, we think that is going to be, you know, the, the space directly north of that green box, we think is going to be a lot more successful because it's, it's, it's sized more for human beings. 
Um, the other thing that the project wants to do is connect HCA, wants to make a better connection for HCA back to the central core of campus. We think it does that, and we'll talk about that here in a second. But we're really excited about where it's placed, how it's masked, and then the potential synergies of that relationship to the other buildings. Yes, sir. Minor point, but just clarification for me. Uh, the HCA is the Wiley Hospitality yes. Culinary Academy. Right. So perhaps we should refer to it as the WHCA. Thank you. Thank you. Which could be pronounced Wicca, <laughs> uh, for those in the phonetic and the phonics. Right? Duly noted. Um, the, uh, the slide on the screen really, it speaks to a number of, of site forces <coughs> that we've, we've talked about. So you see the blue diagonal line, the idea of this building connecting HCA, or I'm sorry, WHCA, <laughs> back to the core, central core campus. The, uh, the north-south arrows, the, the big arrows uh, uh, in yellow, these, there's currently really uh, strong axes to north, to north, from north to south uh, through the site. And then connecting to that, that really great portal that you see on the left-hand side back to the, to the core campus, all of these kinds of, um, all of these kinds of movement patterns um, are really, really important and helped inform the internal logic of the building and its placement on site. So you know, the image on the, on the right is a render, kind, of, kind of a rendered sketch site plan of, of the project and kind of, kind of how it might look. The, image on, the images on the left-hand side are precedent images of, 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 of projects elsewhere that kind of have a similar feel or character to the kinds of spaces we're proposing with this design. The, uh, the image on the right in the site plan, you can see the sort of red box with the yellow um, shape in it. And that yellow shape is, is, is really what we're, what we're calling the internal street for the arts and design building. You know, something we noticed at, at the ATB building where the arts currently is held is there's a, there's a corridor, right? An, an east-west corridor that moves through that building. What we found is, is the faculty and students really use that space um, uh, to display their art, to have crits, and to meet with one another. We sort of took that idea and reinterpreted it in this building in that what's seen is that yellow shape. And you can see the sort of movement patterns that we're seeing there that will literally connect HCA through our building to draw people through our building and to the rest of campus. We think it's going to be really, really exciting. This, the image on the left-hand side at Salem State University, um, we think that's a, it's, it's really uncanny. Um, the, the scale of that space is really, really similar to what I think what we're, what we're envisioning here. The backdrop is very similar to Rainier. Uh, again, we think that's a really nicely scaled space that will be really used. And then the, the sort of the secret weapon, I, in my opinion, is the, is the space to the west um, between CLB and the Arts and Design Building. We think that that could potentially be a really rich um, kind of sculpture garden area or place, a place for you know, three-dimensional work to be displayed. Um, again, all this is to, we think is, is really, really exciting. Materiality has been um, a really uh, important discussion, um, and you know we're certainly looking at the rest of campus and trying to get a better sense of, of okay, so how do we sort of build on this rich tradition that's currently here? Obviously, there's a lot of brick on campus, but there's also a lot of there's concrete. We see in eight, we see in WHCA um, a, a number of materials um, that could be played upon here as well, and certainly weathered steel and glass are are, are prevalent here on campus as well. And so I think the the the, the real challenge for us is how do we build on a really rich tradition here at the campus, but also pivot into the 21st century and do that in a way that's respectful of that tradition, but also um, maybe potentially set up a complementary contrast with what's there, right? Building on what's there, but also moving that into the 21st century a little bit. And we think that what we're talking about with the arts building and CT is starting to do that, um, which we'll talk about here in a second. And, and I should just mention here on the on arts, what we're currently looking at are, are, are a number of different materials. Um, we're looking at glass, we're looking at um, precast concrete, um, really nicely finished precast concrete. We're also looking at potentially glazed brick in some areas. Again, this is all very much in flux right now, and we're looking at a variety of alternatives. <coughs> So 
So the career and technical education building, other side of campus, and you know, going back to the to the to the to the master plan that was developed, the, the building was sort of you can see here um, between uh, the gym, the field house, and ITC, that kind of larger block, the reddish brown block there. We've sort of taken a slightly different approach. We understand that that was sort of a massing idea that was thrown out in, in the master plan as a placeholder. And you know, I think the things that we heard here, there were some overlaps with, with what we heard from arts, but a, little, a few differences. Um, first of all, this is a great program. Um, and um, they are extremely proud and should be of what they're doing, and they want to showcase it. They, are, they, they, want, they want to shout it to the, out to the rooftops that this is really, really cool stuff. And so this building has to highlight and recognize that. Um, it has to showcase that work. Um, they asked us that, you know, they, they want to be, this is a very engaged group of people. They, they asked for an engaging process. And they, wanted, and they wanted a process at the end of the day that could be implemented. And so we're working hard to do that for them. Um, we, we've, got to we've got to create modern, innovative 21st century learning spaces. And we also have to accommodate growth and flexibility. These are the programs that will be housed in this building. So automotive technology, automation engineering technology, HVAC technology, electrical technology, and then a dedicated space for continuing education offerings. Looking around the site, um, so the, the building will be kind of currently, or, or situated kind of currently where the tennis courts are located. Um, there is a, a small group of tree, uh, old growth trees that are on the e northeastern uh, corner of the site that we think are really kind of special and should be uh, preserved and incorporated into the design. Um, it's, a, it's a challenging site. It's, it's very much an edge condition. And, you know, as we looked at its placement on the site, the building's placement, you know, we thought about what are the drivers? What is going to make this place special? Certainly the site is an edge condition. So um, in its position on the kind of that north um, or the kind of the south uh, e west corner of, uh, of the campus, but on the northern half, the northern edge, we looked really carefully at the series of front yards that have been created over the years. And we thought that this project could, could, could do something similar. At the same time, we thought it also needed to have a space of its own and a space for the campus. And so the building actually provides both a front yard as well as um, a kind of a more internal courtyard <coughs> that can be shared both for the programs that are housed within this, with, within this building, but also for the rest of campus. Um, the building has to have a presence as people come in from the north side. Um, and, the, and the site really is a gateway site. It's a site that people move through. Currently, people will move along the, the, the west side of ITC into the, into the central part of campus. This building needs to contribute the, to that and enhance that even further. This is a rendered, kind of a rendered site, uh, site plan sketch that kind of starts to talk about the spaces around the building itself. So the areas where you see the number one, we're kind of calling the meadows, where these are kind of um, areas that are maybe less manicured and more natural, um, less maintenance in these areas, kind of we call them almost like prairies or meadows. And similar to the image that you see on the right-hand corner, the area, the internal courtyard of the site, the number three is what we're calling the internal lawn. And that might be similar to the, to the photograph in the upper left-hand corner on the right <laughs> side of the screen, something a little bit more like turf or, or lawn. And then we have um, sort of at number two, this idea of, of, of these kind of entry courts uh, or kind of little clusters of, of, of groupings of trees where there might be more dappled light, people can gather underneath and sort of a different quality. So we're trying to create these different characters all within this one site. And it's pretty interesting. This is kind of an aerial perspective. So if we were up, up, up in an airplane looking down at the site, just to give you a sense of its relationship to the other buildings, um, you can see this kind of really strong entry court on the western side of the building that brings you in underneath a portal into a really generous courtyard and then, and then brings you on access to ATB and the rest of campus, which we think is pretty exciting. Uh, and it has a really strong connection, uh, as you can see, uh, to ITC as well. Um, so uh, creating these really intentional, important um, gateways uh, through both into this building, through its, uh, through its site, and then beyond into the rest of campus. This is um, an image as we're coming in from the west side into that kind of entry courtyard. Um, you see this kind of compression of space. 
Uh, we're seeing right now uh, an idea of a, of a PV canopy. Again, just really speaking to what's happening inside of these buildings, kind of celebrating that kind of investigation and study that's happening and learning. You move through this portal and that's when you enter into that courtyard space and then into ITC, ATB, and the rest of campus beyond. We're, we're really excited about that. And this is really from the other direction. So we're looking now, sort of standing just west of ITC, looking directly west, back at this project, um, back to the internal courtyard and the lawn space that we talked about earlier. Um, and you can see the automotive bay uh, wing of the building to the left-hand side. So this would all, again, be on display, very transparent, um, you know, again, very much the building as a teaching tool. In terms of materiality, very similar, I think, in approach, uh, just in terms of a wide uh, investigation and study and looking at the current palette of, of the campus and seeing if there's a way to sort of have a dialogue with that and also move it forward a little bit um, or change, maybe change the direction just ever so slightly. Uh, we're, we are looking at brick here. Uh, we are looking at metal panel for some, and specifically a zinc panel, which is kind of a, has kind of a warmer tone to it. And again, this is kind of riffing and playing off of some of the adjacent uh, metal panel that we see on campus. Um, so you can see that on the top image, kind of where we're thinking about that, sort of more on the building faces. And then, you know, we have a single loaded corridor on the north hand side, the north wing of the building. And so we don't want people inside the building to fry. So how do we, how do we make sure that doesn't happen? And so there's things like what's shown on the bottom part of the screen, the sun shading system that really protects that glass <coughs> You know, uh, in the hot summer months and in the winter months, is it's those blades are tuned in such a way that it'll actually allow that sunlight to come in and really heat the inside of the building, which we think could be pretty exciting. And then finally, as we mentioned earlier, the idea of photovoltaic panels as part of this project, which could be again just a, a, a sort of a celebration of what's happening within the buildings, but also a teaching tool for both uh, the faculty and students. You know, and we went to, as we mentioned earlier, there were a number of places we visited, and these were a couple of those places. Uh, Tarrant County College, which was one of uh, BNIM's project uh, in Texas. Uh, this was the Center of Excellence for Energy Technology, a very, very comparable project to, I think, the project that we're working on here on, on JCCC's campus. And what we found in this project is that there are a number of spaces um, throughout in the corridors um, that were used not, they, they, they made the corridors not just corridors, but they were also learning spaces. They were, they were pull-out spaces for, for students to interact. They were, they were study spaces. You can see on the top where there's, you know, there's a place to pull up with your laptop. Um, there is a place to check your phone. There's a place to read a book. But at the same time, you see on the other side of the corridor a lot of transparency so you can see what's happening on the other side. And those doors can blow open as well. So again, lots of flexibility, lots of transparency, the ability to sort of um, collaborate within a space that we would normally just assume is just a place to pass from point A to point B. And then on the right-hand side, similar to the University of Iowa, places where we're showcasing the work, being really smart about how it's staged, places to sit, just really things that we take for granted that I think we're gonna have to really get right on these projects for them to be successful. You know, this is, um, at BNIM, this is our core purpose. So we deliver beautiful integrated living environments that inspire change and enhance the human condition. And I think this is very much true uh, for these projects. Um, we, are, we have this sort of the human condition really at the core of, of what these projects are, and we're trying to make them inspirational, um, very much integrated and certainly beautiful. And then finally, this, this statement, which what a building does matters as much as what it looks like. This is very much true, I think, for these buildings, for these projects. They have to perform at a really high level. They have to be beautiful. They have to operate on all these in all these ways, right? And so this is really for, forefront of what we're trying to do. And finally, I'll wrap up by just sort of outlining, uh, you know, kind of some of the key dates moving forward. So the guaranteed maximum prices will be established this December. Um, we will have a groundbreaking for CTE in January of 2018. Um, <coughs> that should be exciting. Um, and then finally, a month later, we'll have the groundbreaking for arts and design. The con construction will be complete for arts and design in October of 2018, and then finally, um, CTE will be con uh, construct. The construction will be complete for that project on February of uh, 2019. So it's a fairly aggressive schedule, um, but we believe we can do it, 
and we've got some great partners and um, I will certainly open it up to any questions or comments that you have. And again, thank you very much for having me. Questions for James? Trustee Pitt. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, of the campuses you visited and the buildings you've cited mm -hmm. as examples, uh, what was their LEED cert certification and what are we targeting for LEED certification with our buildings? So LEED Silver is what's targeted for our projects. And as part of our um, schematic design deliverable, we provided a scorecard of where we think we're at to date. We think we're on target for that. Um, we're certainly gonna be tracking that all the way throughout the process. I think, um, I think the answer to your first part of the question is um, uh, it varied quite a bit. Um, some, some projects were not LEED certified, some projects were LEED certified. Um, so there was a range of certification. We, we um, you know, with every project we do, um, as just a matter of course, we are going to try to be. We're trying to push on that as much as we can. We're trying to make our projects as as sustainable as they possibly can be. Um, so we sort of do that anyway. Um, but I, I, we think it's we think it's fantastic. The college has sort of set out the goal to say, hey, you know, we we have to meet lead silver now. Lead version four is certainly more challenging than previous versions, and we we know that. Um, but we're, we're excited for the challenge, and we think there's some really good opportunities on these buildings to do that. My follow-up, Mr. Chair, is that um, I think the college has done a very admirable job of being sensitive to LEED certification in our recent projects, and yet at the same time, um, cost will be an issue, and so it's not a matter of uh, becoming platinum or gold or whatever we get at any cost because we will be looking at cost as well. So I guess the challenge is that at least from my perspective, is to be very sensitive to the highest LEED certification we can, we can receive um, with exciting buildings as you've described, but certainly within budget as well. Sure. Thank you. Uh, I just, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, James, great, great job. Uh, it's really nice to see what we've been talking about for so long uh, manifested in these pictures and drawings. You had, uh, um, you had two slides up there for both the, the buildings um, about what does success look like. And I think it's important, from, at least from, from my perspective, to add another bullet to that. Mm -hmm. And that is that uh, we, we want to do all the things that we're talking about, but we also want to make sure that we're coming in within budget. It's sure. kind of piggybacking on what, uh, what Trustee Cook just mentioned, too. I think that's an important aspect of what success will look like with this. I'm going to follow up on that because I, I understand that there are both public and private entities that build buildings that seek those standards but don't seek the certification because of the costs associated with that. Mm -hmm. I mean, is that an option that we would look at to fit this budget as well? I mean, you can build it to those standards, but to go through the LEED certification costs you significant time and fees, as I understand it, to, to get this actual plaque that you can put on the wall or whatever. Yeah, there, there are, certainly, there are costs associated with the certification, and I think that's something we're working through currently with the team, you know, as to whether or not that's appropriate or not for these projects. I think, again, regardless of that, we want to do the right thing, you know, um, and I think that's, that's the, again, the admirable part of the college saying, regardless of whether the plaque goes on the wall, these buildings need to be at least lead silver standard or better. And I think that, so that's, that's really, really important. But yeah, certainly, we're, and that's something we're working through currently with the, the, the team here at the college is, is you know, trying to understand those costs, weighing those a little bit, and seeing if that's something that, that we want to pursue. That, that we haven't, I don't think that's really landed yet, but I think, again, what has landed is the, you know, the, the mandate, frankly, that these buildings have to perform at a high level. Lead silver is our target or better, and, and that's, where we're, that's where we're shooting for. I think what I heard from, Jerry and Dave, and that I would echo is that the other mandate is that we have bid off a very large chunk of $102 million in total projects. So mm -hmm. we, we really need to, uh, slippage there would scare at least one trustee up here. So, sure. do you have a question, Dr. Hutt? James, BNIM did Tarrant County. Correct. Um, what lessons did you learn from Tarrant County that could benefit us? Sure. Um, well, I think. You know, Terrence is really, as I was saying earlier, is a really interesting comp for, for our building. You know, so one thing that we're, we're talking about doing, we're sort of, there's some lessons learned there in terms of things that we think are really positive. 
one thing was that, you know all the duct work, let's say, in the, in the corridors that you saw in some, in, that, in some of those images. We'd like to sort of do that, color code the duct work, make this building kind of open it up, make it transparent, make it really a teaching tool. And so that was something that I think we, we kind of discovered in that process there was that, um, you know, th and this is a, and, and Tarrant, it should be noted, is a, is, a, is, a, is a largely brick campus. And there were a lot of parallels. It was a community college. Um, and yet they were willing to sort of pivot um, to, I think, to a building that is a complementary contrast that does perform at a high level. It's lead platinum. Um, that does start to integrate photovoltaics that does start to be more transparent. They do have garage doors in the corridors. They do have these kind of magnetic spaces that we're looking to do here. So I think we've learned a lot of things from that process that we'd like to take into the to, into CTE. No, no question about it. And Tarrant County is Fort Worth. Fort Worth. Yeah. And, and for our trustees, how many um, uh, members of BNIM, how many employees are working on this project? Oh my gosh. Uh, we have a we have a really good team, uh, <laughs> and it's sizable, as Bar as Barbara as as Barbara and Rex can attest. Um, and we like to get a lot of people involved. Um, and we have this phrase that no one knows as much as everyone. And so, and that's really I think we think that's really true. Um, you're you're making me do some math here. Let me think. Um, at least for each project we have, let's see. I would say for both you know both TTE and Arts, we have about ten people working on those projects you know, kind of in the trenches. Um, and again, I, you know, we're working with Clark Enerson. I don't know, I can't, I can't recall off the top of my head how many they have working on it, but it's a, we have a really strong, robust team. We have, we have experienced members on the team who have done some complicated buildings that are, that's already paying off in terms of that experience, leveraging that into these, into these buildings. And then beyond just the project teams that are kind of in the trenches on a daily basis working on these projects, we like to draw on the entire bench of our office. So, you know, in Kansas City, we have 95 people. We like to draw on those on that ex expertise every day. Um, and and beyond the 95 people in Kansas City, we have a, a few other offices that we can draw upon. Clark Anderson, the same. And that's the way we think about it. Um, we think about it not just the team that's working on it, but also all really leveraging all that expertise and wisdom. Well, thank you. You guys are doing a great job. You got some big challenges, Trust and we really appreciate that. Trustee Ingram. Um, something that I didn't see on either of the lists, which I'm really grateful for, um, is safety. Um, mm -hmm. I'm assuming that everyone believes we have considered safety as we move forward, but are there special things that you're considering now for the safety of faculty and students on this campus? Yeah, thank you. That's a great question. And, you know, it's part of our oath as architects, right? right. You know, um, and so that it's it's always at the forefront of our right. of our of our mind. Um, you know, one of the things we've talked about, given the new some of the new hmm? things here on campus, is just you know, for one one example is um, the idea for a faculty member to go into an office and be able to close the door potentially, or into a room and be able to close the door, but still have transparency from that room mm -hmm. out to the corridor. I think little things like that. Um, I think. Not only the design team, but the great feedback that we've had in interaction with the faculty and staff and administration here have kind of helped steer that, and I think that we'll continue to kind of steer that as we go go forward. Um, there's some things that we can intuitively do that I think will will make that better, and I think again this idea of transparency goes a long way in terms of safety. Thank you. Thank you, James. I think there's one last question that everybody is dying to know is whether or not you used this room to help your joyful and inspiring. A uh, factor for the arts thing, did you? you know? Probably not. It's a pretty joyful and inspiring room. Thank you. Thank you. You're also a very good architect and marketer. Uh, thank you. We're excited about the work that's been done with with your team and and uh, BNIM and the other uh, contractors we have. And then Barbara, thank you and your team for doing that. We'll look forward to your next update. Thank you very much, Mr. Good. Chairman. Before I proceed, uh, I, I just returned from. Well, not just, but recently returned from spending 10 days in Boston. And uh, they have uh, a, a unique way of, of speaking. And uh, they have their slang. And, uh, and uh, when Trustee Cook mentioned that it needs to be the Wiley or the WH uh, or the Wicca, as <laughs> President Joe just mentioned, I thought of uh, my, my trip, and we could call it the Wicked, the Wicked. 
There's, a, there's another word that goes with that, but right. I, will, I, will, I won't use that. <laughs> Wicked is uh, what they, when something's very nice. Okay. Yeah. You're wicked. You had to be in Boston, I guess. Yeah. Uh, thank you, James. Um, continuing with the uh, management committee report, uh, Tom Clayton, director of insurance and risk management, presented uh, his semi-annual property and liability insurance program update. Um, Tom's been with uh, us a long time, and, and he really does a, a great job for the college. Uh, Rachel Lurch, um, Associate Vice President uh, and uh, Financial Services uh, Chief Financial Officer, gave an assessed valuation update to the committee. Uh, Mitch Borchers uh, gave uh, Associate Vice President of Business Services, presented the sole source report as well as a summary of awarded bids between $25,000 and $100,000. And that summary is on page eight of the board packet. Rex Hayes gave an update on capital infrastructure projects and his report is on page 16 of the packet. And uh, next we have uh, several recommendations. I believe there are five to present this evening. The first uh, is from the management committee working agenda. Uh, Barbara Larson, executive vice president of finance and administrative services presented a draft of the 2017-2018 Management Committee Working Agenda as presented on pages two and three of your packet. And uh, there was a recommendation with that and I will make it. It's the recommendation of the Management Committee that the Board of Trustees approve the fiscal year 2017-2018 Management Committee Working Agenda and I will make that motion. Second. Moved and seconded to adopt the Management uh, Committee <coughs> Working Agenda for the the next uh, fiscal year. Any questions? Not all in favor say yes. 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 Opposed no. Motion carries unanimously. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Also, Rachel Alert uh, presented a recommendation related to the college's fiscal 2017-2018 budget. The notice of public hearing is on page five of the board packet and states that the bid will hold its public, uh, the, the board, I'm sorry, the board will hold its public hearing on the budget in August. And with that recommendation, it is the recommendation of the management committee that the Board of Trustees accept the recommendation of the college administration to authorize publication of the public notice hearing, the notice of public hearing form for the 2017-2018 budget subject to adjustment as actual expenditure figures are available. And I will make that motion. Second. Moved and seconded to uh approve the notice of public hearing form for the 2017-2018 budget. Any questions or discussion? Not all in favor say yes. 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 Those no. <clears throat> motion carries unanimously. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And with that uh, uh, motion goes, uh, it is recommended that the, of, uh, is recommendation of the management committee that the board of trustees accept the recommendation of the college administration to authorize the publication of the notice to vote uh, for the 2017-2018 budget at a later date, and I will make that motion. Second. Uh, moved and seconded to, to uh, authorize publication of the notice of vote for next year's budget at a later date. Is there any discussion, questions? If not, all in favor say yes. 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 Opposed, no. Motion carries unanimously. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the next recommendation has to do with signature authority for certain financial operations of the college. The following individuals will be listed as authorized signers. Mr. Greg Musel, our chairman. Mr. Lee Cross, our treasurer. Mr. Joseph Sopcich, uh, our president. And uh, Dr. Barbara Larson, our executive vice president of finance and administrative services. And with that, it is the recommendation of the management committee that the Board of Trustees accept the recommendation of the college administration to designate the aforementioned individuals as authorized signers for the college accounts, and I will make that motion. Second. Moved and seconded to approve the signature signatures for the uh, college's accounts. Any discussion? If not all in <coughs> favor say yes. Yes. Opposed, yes. no. Motion carries unanimously. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. The next two recommendations are for a request for a proposal and a bid. The first is an RFP for the annual contract for athletic apparel, gear, and equipment. 
and it is the recommendation of the, man of the management committee that the Board of Trustees accept the recommendation of the college administration to approve the renewal of the annual contract for athletic apparel, gear, and equipment with BSN Sports at a total annual expenditure not to exceed $200,000, and I will make that motion. Second. Moved and seconded to uh, renew the contract uh, with BSN Sports. Any questions or discussion? If not, all in favor say yes. 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 Opposed, no. Motion carries unanimously. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Our final recommendation is for Creston and additional audiovisual equipment. Uh, we had additional information at our uh, management committee materials regarding this bid, and I will ask Barbara Larson to summarize that information. Barbara? Yes, thank you, Trustee Lindstrom. Um, the management committee received additional information about this procurement, <coughs> and we wanted to uh, talk with the full board about it. Um, this was a procurement that was actually um, issued and should have been brought to the board in June. This is for equipment for our new um, active learning classrooms. This was an oversight on uh, our staff's part. Two, uh, two purchase, purchase orders were issued. Each of those purchase orders was less than $100,000, which is um, the normal approval for the Board of Trustees. However, the total of those two purchase orders totaled, totaled $140,635.95. Um, obviously, this was, again, an oversight on our part. Um, Mitch Borchers and I have discussed a procedure so that this doesn't happen in the future, but we wanted to inform you of this. Questions? Trustee Mr. Chair, Chair, I would just like to say that I had a chance to visit with uh, Dr. Larson about that, and I really appreciate the staff catching it and uh, taking it upon themselves to put in some procedures in place to uh, prevent this uh, kind of an innocent uh, <coughs> happening, thinking it was two different uh, uh, items when it was under one. So I want to thank them for bringing uh, that to our attention. Agreed. And, uh, I have a recommendation, okay. Barbara, if you, are you done? Yes, thank and, you. And I also want to, uh, um, Trustee Cross and I and, my, and myself, we're, we were at the meeting, we didn't catch it. And uh, we appreciate staff bringing that to our attention. I think that's a, a, just an illustration of what kind of staff we have here that uh, um, they're doing a great job. So thank you, Barbara. Um, with that, uh, it is the recommendation of the management committee that the Board of Trustees accept the recommendation of the college administration to approve the lowest acceptable bid of $72,326.38 from SK, SKC Communications and $68,309.57 from Audiovisual Innovations Incorporated for a total expenditure of $140,635.95 for Creston and additional audiovisual equipment, and I'll make that motion. Second. Moved and seconded to approve the uh, lowest acceptable bids as stated. Any questions or discussion? If not, all in favor say yes. 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 Opposed, no. Motion carries unanimously. Mr. Chairman, that, conclu that concludes my report. Thank you, Dave. Uh, we're ready for the Treasurer's report, Trustee Cross. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, the board packet contains the Treasurer's report for the month ended May 31st, 2017. <coughs> and some items of note include uh, page one of the Treasurer's report is the general post-secondary technical education fund summary. As of May 31st, 92% of the college's fiscal year had expired. The unencumbered cash balance as of May 31st, 2017 in all funds was $79.9 million. In May, the college made scheduled semi-annual payments on the Series 2011, Series 2012, and Series 2015 revenue bonds. Uh, these payments totaled $249,613 and are reflected in the revenue bond debt service fund in this month's Treasurer's Report. An ad valorem tax distribution of $37.8 million was received from the County Treasurer in June and will be included in next month's report. Expenditures in the primary operating funds are within the approved budgetary limits. And therefore, Mr. Chair, it is the recommendation of the College Administration that the, the Board of Trustees approve 
the treasurer's report for the month ended May 31st, 2017, subject to audit. Second. Moved and seconded to accept the treasurer's report, subject to audit. Any questions? Trustee Cross? Just a comment. I just wanted to thank the county for the $37.8 million and <coughs> Johnson County for Thanks. continuing to invest in this wonderful asset. Amen. All in favor say yes. 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 Opposed no. The treasurer's report is adopted. Unanimously. Yeah, uh, Dr. Sopcich, monthly report to the board. Thank you, Trustee Musil. In front of you, you've received the president's report. Um, this report seems to be getting better and better, especially now with the first um, feature being the collaboration center. And you can see the remarkable work that's going on there, um, as well as the frequency of use. So I believe this has exceeded our expectations, and we really look forward to the future and see what additional programming we're going to have in there. Um, we're going to do a lightning round, I know, by popular demand. And to get us started, uh, Dr. Larson, Barbara. Thank you, Dr. Sopcich. Uh, July 1st has come, and with that, uh, the introduction of concealed carry in our buildings. While most of us had hoped not to be in this position, I don't think that as a college we could have done more to proactively prepare for this new landscape. I want to acknowledge all the teams that participated uh, in this transition, beginning with the COPS Committee, who advised us on additional ways to promote a culture of safety here. <laughs> Um, as well as the Office of General Counsel, who guided us throughout policy development and marketing and communications and video services for all of their work on our communication strategy. The five-minute video that was produced and posted on the college's website in April has now been viewed over 1,500 times. And this doesn't include the major local media outlets that reference the video in their coverage of the topic. In addition, we relied on campus services and access control for key logistical support. But most importantly, I want to acknowledge the outstanding work of Elisa Pacer, our emergency preparedness manager, and Chief Russell and the entire police department uh, for their hard work and professionalism during this transition. Uh, you'll note that the former signs at entrances were removed and new signage regarding no open carry in our buildings were uh, posted, were placed over the July 1st weekend and were up and ready to go by Monday, July 3rd. As of today, we've had no reported incidents uh, relative to concealed carry, no incidents of concern reported. I realize that these are the summer months and uh, we are well prepared, however, for the fall semester. I am really honored to work with the people that I work with, and um, I thank all of the board for your support for this, uh, for this transition. Again, I, I can't think of a single thing that we didn't do to, um, to help us prepare for this, so I'm, I'm very grateful. Any questions of Barbara regarding this issue? Sure. If I may, I, I think that that's accurate. I think short of recruiting members for the NRA and changing NRA policy, that this board, this administration, this campus, this faculty did just about everything humanly possible to prevent this. Would that be a fair assessment? I think so, yes. I, I, I don't mean to be ridiculous, but I, I do think it's ridiculous, and I just wanted to comment. I thank you and Dr. Sobchik and the board for everything that they did to prevent this. Thank you, Trustee Cross. Um, Dr. McLeod. Uh, it's been an eventful summer. You've heard a little bit before about uh, some of the changes we were making in academics with regard to our reorganization and the way in which we're approaching moving our units into better alignment with one another. The fruits of some of that work have started to, to, to be um, borne out in that we are now starting to look at how to clo more closely align some of our degrees. So our next strategic step will be to look at our degree offerings um, and how we have aligned programs so that we can streamline uh, some of our courses. In some cases, we have duplication of skills, uh, outcomes that are very similar among multiple classes. So we'll be able to maybe cull uh, to lower some of the credit hour requirements for some of the degrees as we really look at now that things are in proper alignment, where are we with regard to what the outcomes are at the course level and how does that feed the program. Um, so really that's gonna be our, our next step uh, in June. We had a, a great meeting um, with some of the leadership from counseling uh, and advising 
uh, and myself and the deans as we sat down and started to talk about um, the fundamental differences between some of our AA, AS, and AAS degrees. And we've started a pilot wherein we're going to pull a uh, program from three different functional areas, one from STEM, one from humanities, and one from CTE to look at how we would create a more streamlined design, easier for students to understand uh, in the age in which so many of them kind of abjure advising and do these things from online tools. We want to provide students with a clear, concise way to understand uh, what they're engaging themselves in and provide them with the best possible advice uh, short of being able to get them to come in and sit down with a, with a counselor. We'd like them to be able to see what it takes to finish the program that they've started as part of the completion agenda that we've embarked on and part of the Pathways Project that I'm working on uh, with Dr. Weber. That's great. Thank you, Mickey. Uh, Gerb, are you ready? I'm just kidding, Gerb. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we always do that to new, new people who started, so just, excuse me. Um, <laughs> Dr. Weber, Randy? I don't know if I trust you now. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <clears throat> Dr. McLeod uh, referenced our Pathways project a little bit, and so I was going to spend a little time uh, describing kind of our work to date and some of our work in the future on that. As a reminder, we kicked off our Pathways project uh, a year ago now, a little more than, with I would say two, two mantras from our, first, or our most recent strategic plan we're closing up in mind, them being students receiving consistent advice across campus. and better support for self-navigating students. Those are two big things we're looking at. How do we provide consistency and how do we help self-navigating students? So our first cohort uh, for our Pathways last fall was our first time full-time. There were 1,404 students um, who were first time full-time. And some of the metrics that we were tracking with them were what were their course withdrawal rates? What were their course pass success rates? Um, what was their average institutional GPA? And what percentage of those students returned the following spring? Um, we're proud to report that each of those metrics um, outperformed any of the best metric for the four years prior for the same cohort. So for example, course withdrawal rate was at a low of 8.3%, um, almost a full percent better than the 13 cohort of 9.2. ABC success rate, so course success rate, 71% was high, not, no year prior had exceeded 70%. Um, another exciting really one that I want to jump out, their, their, their average GPA was higher, but students who started in the fall and returned in the spring returned at 86% of this cohort returned. Um, previous high was 83%. Uh, so, so we're seeing some, some positive momentum. The way we got there with these students, uh, if you'll recall, we committed to turning six of our part-time success advocate positions to full-time. And they, they took this cohort on as uh, case management bro broke them down. And their sole responsibility was to better connect those students with existing resources on campus. And I, I, I'm gonna give you some, some, a little bit of numbers here of how we know when sometimes that worked and sometimes we realize it didn't work. So for example, they, uh, they told students to go to the Math Resource Center. A number of them did and a number of them didn't because this is still advisory and not required. Um, but for those who went, 59% of them got a C or better. For those who didn't, 36% got a C or better. And so what we're doing is we're informing some of their conversations too. So 21% greater likelihood of getting a C or better for those who went to the Math Resource Center. So they didn't tutor math. They tried to get students to the Math Resource Center. The other fun one that had jumped out at me today that I was like, oh my gosh. So 144 of these students, so right at 10% um, of them, went on academic probation. Of 144 students who went on academic probation, only one of them met with their advocate. So um, we're seeing that, that meeting with them increases your likelihood of coming back. And these are important numbers for us because as they continue to work with this next fall's cohort, it informs their conversations, it helps drive it, and we're getting more and more of that behavioral type of data that kind of feed where we want to go. So, so that's a little bit of a historical. I could talk on this all night. What I want to do a little bit is just tell you a little bit on where we're going. So from here, our pathway started with how are we, how are we tracking and engaging uh, students and 
how do we inform their choice moving forward? That was year one. This past spring we said what we want to do is continue to do that, create some automations and, and some, some better support for students, a student success tool. But in addition to that, we want to do academic planning. And that's the, that's the uh, cohort um, or the team that, that Dr. McLeod's leading too. So we've got two simultaneous things going on, student engagement and academic planning. That's all tied to a student's um, pathway experience. Uh, this fall, we're doing an RFP uh, to go ahead and bring in some automated tools. All, most of their work now is very manual. A student has to self-report, did you do this? Yes, I did. So we're bringing some automation stuff in that if they have a success plan that says you should have these activities, we know when they can do it so we can make this scale to more than 1,400 students. Um, I think that pretty much covers what I wanted to. And Randy, to this is on. all about student success and completion, the completion agenda, right? You bet, absolutely. Now the trick is on this what, so if, if they're more successful in the course, they're more likely to come back in the spring, they're more likely to come back in the fall. The big number we want to move here, we're watching that persistence from fall to spring and fall to fall, but the big one's graduation and transfer. The way we count that though is it takes a cohort three years for us to look at their graduation plus transfer. So we want to we want to check them along the way and see see how they're doing. Early indicators are they're doing well and it, but it'll take us 3 years to determine uh, their graduation and transfer rate. So the faculty is doing great a great job in the classroom. The resource centers are doing fantastic. It's just a matter of informing the students the benefits for them to take advantage of those services. Yeah, ultimately we want to get to an informed choice where they really have no choice but to make the right decision because of the information we put in front of them. That's great. Thank you, Randy. Uh, Brett, were those numbers with regards to the Math Resource Center that Randy was using, were those accurate? I mean, it's a joke, Brett. Don't freak out. I mean, it's just a joke. <laughs> okay, I just want to, you got to check up on those numbers with Randy. Uh, um, thank you, Randy. That was fantastic. Um, Karen. Taking all the numbers out of my report, so you don't ask me that. <laughs> in, in CE, we've really been focusing on a couple of things as we're moving into the next fiscal year, and one is really strengthening those external partnerships. So you've probably heard us talk about that at a number of the external events, and also our customer experience. Uh, over the last couple of years, we've really built a strong partnership at the Learning and Career Center in Edgerton at the Logistics Park KC. So what we wanted to help them with is building a stronger community of those companies. So we've been working with Elevate Edgerton, their economic development uh, group, and, and the city of Edgerton to see what we could do to help strengthen and getting those companies to know each other well. So uh, one of the things we decided to do is HR roundtables. We had our first one this past week down there that was just for the companies there in the logistics park. Really helped them share their um, what, what's going on, concerns, best practices, and we would be there more as a resource to help drive them to things that are that we could maybe support them with here at, at the college or other resources in the community. So uh, we thought we would do it once a quarter. It was uh, so well received, they're gonna do it monthly. So Steve Hill is working on pulling that together and we, our plan is to continue to host those at the Learning and Career Center. Uh, one, one great thing that came out of that is all of those HR professionals need certifications for their SPHR and PHR. So they were delighted to learn that those are services that we can provide here as well as help them with their internships and a lot of the resources we have in student services as well. And then some of you have already heard about what's going on in SBDC. We have an event coming up on the 27th. I've given you that brochure. And it's how to buy or sell a business. Uh, from a customer experience perspective, if you've owned your own company or you know entrepreneurs, it is very, very hard to close up your business and get to professional development that goes on for days and days and days. And often that's what happens if you have to meet with multiple people to find out information. So we thought, well, let's, could we get buyers and sellers in the room together and all of those resources they would be looking for with the goal of getting around 50 people at the conference? Well, as of today, we're up to 78 people. We, our goal now is to get 100 people by next week enrolled in the program. And we have those subject matter experts that will be there to talk to them. We have a buyer's track and a seller's track. And we're really excited about the way the sponsors have also uh, been very supportive. And you'll see them listed to keep that price point low to get all those experts there as well, too. So excited about that from a, a change on a customer experience. And then lastly, um, from a customer experience, I just want to share that we've, um, one of the 13 strategic initiatives we worked on last year was online learning. 
And so we worked on that team and really put a focus on what could we do and implemented some best practices, which for us, a lot of that became marketing efforts and what we would do to change how we were marketing. So uh, I just, you know, it takes a lot of us here to get things done. So I wanted to acknowledge Chris and his team for all the help they've given us. They really helped us get that presence uh, changed in our, on our print. We still do print catalogs and do a lot of mailings to our customer base as well as help us with our location on the sites um, here at the college. And as a result of that, we saw an, a 32% increase in our online classes. And year over year, we were at 536 enrollments. And then this past year, we're up to 710 now at the same time, year over year. Uh, so that was really beneficial. And we turned those very, very quickly. And they really helped us. Um, in addition, we did a, uh, uh, we normally don't do lots of programming on that week after Memorial Day. So from a customer experience, we thought, well, let's just throw it out there and do something creative and say, get your leadership certificate in a week. And we thought, well, we'll see how that goes. They did some very quick turns on digital marketing. And we not only offered all seven of the programs, we had to offer two of all seven of each of those programs. And we had 21 completers over that four-day period. So we found that that customer experience was, we're slow at work that week. That's a great week for us to come and do professional development. So, so thank you, Chris, for, and your team for all the help and um, getting those things accomplished. A couple things. So is that digital marketing really that effective? Absolutely. Just versus putting stuff out there all the time. Yeah. What does Sorry. that mean? That's where the audience is, without disagreement. Just for the public. No, I mean that, that's just really where you know where you know the students and they're searching for information. So it's really giving them the information and the time that they're searching for it, rather than trying to attempt to mail a postcard or a flyer or even in some instances a handbook. Mm -hmm. It's just serving information at the right time and the right place. For example, on the online courses, I'll just for that from digital standpoint, we, uh, we took all those out of our print marketing because it's costly to get all that in there and, uh, and, and give, it, give it a format that's usable as well as the searching on our site. And we were able to really reformat all that, get it back into our print and still not make it costly to do that and customers can find it. I mean, they're getting ready to make a choice. They're gonna hit buy at some point, but if they can't find it, they're gonna go to the next resource. So I've, we found it to be very effective. It is in direct access too. Mm -hmm. Trusty Cross, that's another thing too. You know, they can act on it instantly or find more information out you know, in that moment on the, on the online platform or digital versus a, a postcard or a flyer on the same as smart effective with the secondary and with the primary decision. No, thank you. I didn't mean to interrupt. I just thought that no, was I... important to practically explain. So. Do you have another question, Lee? I, just a comment, uh, just to thank Karen. I mean, as I travel the state of the country and I tell people I serve at the largest community college in Kansas, I get this, oh, yeah, and I say, we're the size of a Big Ten school. And they go, they look at me kind of funny, like, and it's thanks to you and everyone on your overwhelming side of the organizational chart that uh, you guys help us get there, I think, through continuing education. And I just wanted to thank you. Uh, one more. CE is continuing education. Right. Right. Correct. Mm -hmm. And SBDC is the Small Business Development. <laughs> yes. Center. Thank you, Greg. Thank just, you. That's we, we're using our acronyms again. I know. And I need to stop doing that. Yeah. They're important. What you did is so important that, as Lee said, that make sure people watch and know what, exactly what we're talking about. Our continuing education program is strong. Um, one more question. In your report, you had that Jack Harwell from the Small Business Development Center. Um, was in Paola and Oswatomi at those chambers. How, how big is the reach on this? I mean, how far are, you, are we, do we have people out? Oh, well, you know, all over. I mean, we're in Wyandotte County. Um, we go as far as Paola, Spring Hill, Gardner, Edgerton. Uh, it's, it's, it's quite a reach. Sometimes we're asked to go there. Now we're, we're careful because we, we have other service areas with the procurement technical assistance as well as the Small Business Development Center. But on the continuing ed side, we pretty much, you know, we, we go all over the place, so. That's great, thank you, Karen. Trustee Lindstrom had a question. Okay. Karen, one, one more question on the buy and sell of business. What is the capacity for that? It's unlimited. But our goal is to get, <laughs> really, we could probably put about 150 in the room that we have but from a setup perspective, uh, but we could move the catering out of that room and, and go to that level. We would love to see 100 in that room. Right and, now, and that's what we're planning for. Where are you now? <laughs> we're in the uh, Rainier Center in 101. No, 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 the numbers. 78. 78, okay, great, yes. thank you. Yes. Thank you, Karen. Yes. Uh, a few other things. I was just gonna give a brief update on enrollment. Um, 
This summer, we've had 8,441 students enrolled. That would probably be among the large, more than most community colleges would have during their fall semesters, right? Um, what's interesting about that, and that's up from a year ago, slightly, about 1.7%, um, but this is what's kind of fascinating about this. 45% of those credit hours are online. So we're looking at 50% face-to-face here on campus and 45% online, and that online's up 10% versus a year ago. So that's just for the summer. Sure, Dave. Uh, what, what impact uh, on those numbers would the metro rate have had? Wow, I don't know for the summer. We could look at that. Okay. The metro rate, Randy, has, has exceeded our expectations. Certainly, we know in the, in the uh, fall semesters and spring semesters. I mean, you're up. You're, it was up over 39%. And we have about, a, last academic year, I think we had close to 1,000, almost 1,000 students taking advantage of the metro rate. So interestingly, we had, uh, I think, with the president of in the last week, and a number of the students who came uh, were, were coming over with, with, with family members and that. So it's a, it's a different number. So across the board, if you look at summer, spring, fall, our enrollment's hanging in there slightly up, maybe half a percent, a little bit more than 1%, but that's positive. Um, there's another uh, point I want uh, to make here about awards for the academic year 17. Um, we awarded 171 more degrees and certificates in academic year 17, and that was 3,604 compared to the previous year um, at 3,433. That's up 5%. Um, but, John, I got a question for you. It says here that 2,972 students received an award compared to 283. So obviously, if we have 3,604 with regards to the degrees, some of those students, because that number's less, so you got duplicate awards and certificates going out? Correct. So that's what's accounting for that. And, and, those, are, and those are great numbers. Um, that's, and, and that's a reflection of all the work that everyone's doing across campus, not just in getting students to come here, but also in making sure that they succeed as they go through their, through their programs. Um, Karen was talking about the SBDC. Um, recently, the SBDC team worked with Shawnee Mission School District, their culinary program specifically, and served as consultants for them um, to help them write a business plan, uh, rehearse their presentations um, as they were getting ready for the National Skills USA competition. And it's great seeing the college be a part of that. We work really closely with the, with the high schools. Um, and of course, we're big fans of the Shawnee Mission School District, and it was super to be, um, to be involved in that, in that. So thank you, Karen, for having your team do that. Um, saw Chris Carroll today at the, we hosted the, um, what is that, Northeast Johnson County Chamber, and Chris was here, and he was super excited because AT&T um, has awarded us an Aspire grant specifically to our automotive technology program. And it's a, it's a grant um, that is uh, given to us to help create online resources for English language learners, ELL, um, in its automotive technology degree program. So this is for students who struggle with English. Um, and it's one thing being able to, to manually uh, make adjustments to, you know, to an engine or, or whatever. Um, but it's also important to understand technically with regards to the, um, you know, to the manuals and, and all of those. So um, this is primarily for introductory automotive courses. Um, the goal is to have a higher success rate, obviously, in their automotive courses and become job ready. I'd like to recognize Holly um, Milkelwart. She's a professor of English as a Second Language and English for Academic Purposes, and also Jack Ireland, an associate professor in automotive technology for getting this uh, up and running. It's a real critical program, and also special thanks to AT&T for, um, for providing this grant. Um, when you go through your report, you're gonna see some really positive upswings in, in the reports uh, from the Career Development Center. I mean, you have percentages almost um, like 23, 29% of more usage of specific areas in that. And Randy, what's, the, what's behind that? Well, that just goes back to that connection between that pathway. We've got areas really good, um, really good job of uh, referring one another and working really hard on the singular student experience. So where, where do I take a student and, and, and support them and what's that next step? And, and Chris and, and John's team and Tom's team have all been working a little bit to say how do we create a more uh, consistent message. But knocking down those silos and working with peers and collaboration, I mean, I, there's not one single thing, it's just that mindset that's helped us get to those things. 
mean, that was astounding. That was fantastic versus a year ago that increased usage. So thank you for that. Um, all of the things that happen here are the results of everyone uh, working together. We have so many dedicated professionals here um, working hard for student success. And I think that's one of the reasons why Johnson County is so admired throughout the region uh, and the country. Um, because everyone's pulling together on this to uh, inspire learning, to transform individuals, and to strengthen our community. So that ends the report. Thank you very much. Thank you. Questions, Dr. Cook? A couple of comments. Um, one, thank you for the report. I really appreciate the detail. And again, I think for trustees, there is priceless information for us to become better advocates of our college every day out in the community. I'll talk more about that in my report of KECCT. But I really appreciated the, um, the reminder of the six uh, traditional classrooms that as a result of discussion with faculty, uh, we're trying to renovate them to uh, deliver a more efficient current uh, teaching learning delivery system. And uh, we get caught up in the new building project, but I really appreciate the attention to those traditional classrooms and the faculty's attitude to say, hey, how can we change these spaces to make learning better for our customers, our students? So thank you for that. And then secondly, on the student uh, success advocacy activity area, Re Dr. Weber, I really appreciate the detail on the eight different strategies. And I guess for the public, uh, we, uh, we um, we have tried to enhance our advocacy for student success, and I'll also speak to that more uh, during my report. But uh, the eight strategies include contacts at the front desk, the telephone face-to-face -face online orientation, the pathways cohort touch points, which you addressed, Dr. Weber, application calls, uh, other outgoing advocate touch points for non-pathways related, and then the success center email. So I want to compliment the effort uh, to not just try one strategy to communicate with, with students, but to uh, try and get their attention in uh, a variety of ways and uh, make them available. Um, uh, Trustee Lindstrom uh, whispered to me when, uh, about listening. You know, they, we say that to trustees and we sometimes don't always listen either. And I'm always reminded of our, of our great uh, ex-basketball coach at Missouri, Norm Stewart, uh, upon his retirement, uh, a reporter asked him, what's it like to be a, a college basketball coach in a major Division I school? And he said without hesitation, well, it's a lot like being a caretaker at a cemetery. Uh, you have a lot of people under you, but nobody's listening. And uh, sometimes, even though we try a lot of strategies, people aren't listening. But I really appreciate the effort to connect uh, the message to have an efficient teaching and learning distribution. Thank you. I doubt if anybody had the Tri Board of Trustees bingo card and had a Norm Stewart yeah. quote on it, <laughs> Dr. Cook. I'm just, I'm just guessing. Um, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> I know they're out there. I just bet they're out there. Um, there is no old business and there is new, no new business that I'm aware of, so we're ready for the Faculty Association report, Dr. Arjo, who will undoubtedly have a quote of some sort for us from a famous philosopher. <laughs> if you want one. <laughs> Uh, thank you. It's always good to uh, have a chance to talk. Um, I was thinking the meeting got started. I could just say the FA didn't meet this month. But even though we did not meet, uh, we are busy, at least uh, the officers. We've done some prelim uh, preliminary work, uh, looking forward to negotiations. And this is just kind of an interesting time for academic people, people like me who had spent their whole lives, adult lives, in the academic world. Late summer, spring fading away, falls beginning to loom, we're wrapping up summer courses, so we have a lot to look forward to, and I know a lot of people are starting to look at their classes, tweak their classes. Uh, we've lost a lot of faculty to retirement the last couple of years, so those of us who've been here a long time like me have losing some cherished colleagues, but the flip side of that, of course, is we're getting a lot of new colleagues, a lot of new hires, and we're looking forward to uh, to working with them. Um, it's going to be an interesting year to be sure. We have the election coming up. We have negotiations coming up. I won't say much about either, either of those. Uh, I did enjoy very much seeing uh, the presentation about the new buildings. You guys should have architects come more often. <laughs> that was pretty uh, interesting stuff. At least for me, before I would discard philosophy, I actually was thinking of going into architecture. I, so I'm not just being facetious. I did enjoy those uh, presentations. Um, I did want to kind of build on that just a bit. 
um, I've said this before, um, it's great for new buildings. It's wonderful to see faculty involved with the process of designing these things. I think it's a good sign of a healthy college when I go talk to my dean and there's architectural drawings all over his office. I mean, this is a, a sign of things are moving in a very good direction and it's very gratifying to talk to my colleagues in the arts at how much they have been involved in getting input into um, those buildings. Uh, but ultimately what makes these things work is uh, the people who are gonna move into them and teach classes in them and do their work in them. And so I want to just hit that point uh, yet again and give maybe a very concrete bit of uh, evidence of just how powerful full-time faculty can be, and that is by uh, talking a little bit about the CoLab. Um, to be perfectly honest, I was a bit of a CoLab skeptic when I first heard about this. I thought it seemed like, well, one of these things we're going to do because everybody else has to have one. We should have one, too. I thought maybe it had boondoggle written all over it. Uh, but frankly, I've been proven very wrong. It's been wonderful. It's a great success. I'm very happy to have been proven wrong about that. Um, but a great part of why it's been a success has been the degree and the speed and the enthusiasm with which it's been embraced by full-time faculty. I talked to Christy about this, and she confirmed that a great deal of what goes on there is spearheaded and uh, begun by, driven by full-time faculty who saw an opportunity to do something really fun and very interesting with uh, what is a great space. So I would expect the new buildings is going to be the same story. You bring these here and you will see faculty rise to the occasion. Uh, the policy in the last few years, for good reason, has been the level of the bargaining unit, keep that constant, replace people who retire but not add to the total number of full-time faculty. Um, I would like to begin to build the case for maybe moving past that. I think the time has come to consider the possibility that maybe we're in a position to grow the total number of full-time faculty, and I do think it would pay dividends in the way we've seen in places like the CoLab, and I expect we will see with uh, the new buildings. So I put that as an invitation for the board to think about as we wrap up another cycle, namely the budget cycle. <laughs> Thank you. Questions? May I? Yes, you may. Uh, President Arjo, thank you for being here. Um, I have three questions for you, frankly, just to give you an overview. Uh, w why should we hire more full-time faculty? And uh, second, uh, the, the President's report lists out a number of different international events and educational events that we do. I know Brian Wright's involved in a bunch of them. Could you speak as to why that's important to the faculty and for our total body of students, like why the international events are important to the total body? And then why do you like the windows so much in the <laughs> building? I'll start the last question first. I just like windows. I like openness. I, I like that. Um, you know, this concern was raised, well, we're always worrying about potential bad events and windows maybe make people vulnerable. But at the end of the day, I do think we don't want to concede too much to fear. We should build on an optimistic view of the ourselves, our institution, and openness and transparency, I think, speaks to that. Uh, regarding the first question, um, I mean, the most pragmatic, immediate reason for hiring more full-time faculty is we have programs that need them. Um, that could grow, could do more if we had more people committed to being at this institution for a significant part, at least, of their careers, and who could bring that kind of energy and commitment and, and engagement. Um, energy and commitment to who? To their programs, to students, to the college. And to execute the things that the trustees right. and the administration have chosen Absolutely to do. Absolutely right. Uh, regarding international programs, I mean, I'm kind of a junkie for that kind of stuff. As you know, <laughs> I like to travel. I like to see what other people do other places. I like to engage uh, colleagues from around the world. I like to have students from around the world. Um, so I'm not sure how much justification it needs other than simply being uh, what it is. But we live in an increasingly globalized world. We live in a world where confronting cultures is just a fact of life. And the more we do that as a college, the better we are as a college. Thank, thank you. Appreciate that. Um, no more questions. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of your summer. I will see you August 7th or whatever our next meeting is. <coughs> so, yep. Thank you, Dr. Arjo. Um, Johnson County Research, County Education Research Triangle, Trustee Lindstrom. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Before I start, uh, my apologies to Rachel. I didn't mean to say lurch. I meant to say leers. So uh, it's what I get for being in Boston for 10 days. So <laughs> uh, uh, 
As a reminder, the Johnson County Education Research Triangle was created in 2008 when the county's voters supported a one-eighth cent sales tax. Today that generates, uh, it, it, it was recently in the 15 million, today that generates approximately $17 million a year annually to advance academic research and business endeavors at its partner organizations, K-State Olathe Campus, KU Edwards Campus, and KU Clinical Research Center. Um, as, as it relates to the board, uh, the board last met on Monday, April 10th, and um, uh, reports for sales tax for the month of June were down a little bit. Uh, uh, the sales tax receipts to the JCERT were $1,346,934.19, which is 4% down from the same time last year. Uh, for more information uh, about the JCERT, uh, Johnson County Triangle, go on www.johnsoncounty. Uh, triang Joko Triangle com and follow uh, Joko uh, J Cert on Facebook and Twitter. The next meeting of the Johnson County Research Triangle will be on Monday, November sixth, two thousand seventeen, seven thirty a.m. at the KU Clinical Research Center, which is forty three fifty Shawnee Mission Parkway, Fairway, Kansas. Mr. Chairman, that concludes my report. Thank you. Thank you. Questions, Trustee Mister. Not we're ready for the Kansas Association of Community College Trustees report. Dr. Cook. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we have not met since our last meeting, and our next KACCT meeting is September 8th and 9th at Butler uh, County Community College. And if any of you are interested in attending that, let us know. But I think Dr. Sopcic and I will be attending. I would like to take this time, though, to report quickly on ACCT. We had a board retreat last week in Jersey City, New Jersey. and. Uh, I, I, uh, it was a good experience. It took me just under three hours to fly from Kansas City to uh, LaGuardia Airport, and then it took me uh, just under three hours to ride in a taxi cab from LaGuardia to Jersey City, New Jersey, which is 10 miles, uh, starting at 5 p.m. Uh, Thursday. And um, for, for a, a kid from Kansas, uh, I wasn't accustomed to, uh, let me just say I practiced my patience. The good thing is I put the, the map on my phone to see if the taxi cab driver was going to, you know, take me the long way around. And he really did a good job trying to get me there. But what's amazing is, is those of you who have lived and traveled in a city like New York City, everybody's bumper to bumper in any direction you go, and yet everybody's blowing their horns telling people to get going. So I just don't understand that rationale. But we had a great agenda. We... Uh, we had a chance to visit the Hudson County Community College campus. And as we look at our campus and we think of the challenges we have, Hudson County is comprised of six buildings in the inner city of Jersey City, New Jersey, right across the Hudson River from lower Manhattan. And uh, they have a, a building on this corner of the block, for example, and you go a block or two and there's another building and then you go a block and there's another building. And uh, I, would, I would think that their security is, is a lot more challenging than ours in terms of student safety. And thank you for pointing that out, Trustee Ingram, on your question about our new buildings. Um, but it was really interesting to see the challenges that a college in the inner city has. Uh, their culinary program has been recognized as an award-winning culinary program. Their library has been recognized as an award-winning library. And uh, they're, very, they're very impressive facilities, but when I compare and look back uh, to what we have, you know, I just... It's, e it's very easy to be proud of not only the buildings and the campus, but again, I say the delivery of the teaching and learning experience. Um, I was very impressed with their president, Glenn Gabbert. And for those of you that have been here a year or two longer than I have, uh, Dr. Gabbert spent, what, Dr. Sopcich, about 14 years on this campus. Uh, so his roots are from Johnson County Community College. And Hudson County Community College was really at risk with certification prior to his arrival. They were in a lot of trouble. Uh, with enrollments, uh, with operations, and uh, he, has, uh, he has done a marvelous job of uh, turning that, that campus around. And so uh, we, wh what's interesting is when I go to these meetings and the board is comprised of 26 members from coast to coast, border to border, 
Uh, it's not infrequently to hear, well, such and such at our college spent time at Johnson County Community College. And so there's always a point of reference that they know who we are. Uh, Trustee Cross, you mentioned when you travel the state and the country. And that's, that's very, very true. So I'm, I'm very proud and pleased to represent uh, this college at a national board where uh, we're highly regarded and broadly known. I want to point out to you the uh, uh, copy you have of the ACC T uh, strategic plan, the 2020 vision. And interestingly, if you open up the folder, you'll see we have but two goals. One is on student success, and one is on how do trustees become better trustees in this evolution of the community college. And so Dr. Weber, I really appreciated your uh, report on how we're dealing with student success. What we talked about at our board retreat is do, do the 1,108 community colleges in this country have a common definition of for what student success is about? And so here we've listed uh, four objectives and a number of select strategies that try to deal with this understanding of what student success is. And I appreciate the efforts, Dr. McLeod and Dr. Weber, we have through the process of whether it's curriculum or student uh, advocacy of our faculty and our team trying to understand what student success is. Uh, but that's kind of what the national perspective is. And then this issue about how do we become better trustees, again, objectives and strategies. The feedback we got from NLS, the National Legislative Summit that we hold annually uh, in February in Washington, D.C., and our annual Congress that is held in the fall, the feedback we received from those conferences <coughs> year after year, and we reviewed that from the last two sessions, trustees want more information on student success, and they want more information on how to become a better trustee in their respective colleges. So I, I would ask you to take a look at this, uh, review the mission statement, and, uh, and, and then please uh, have a pretty good idea of the core values. They're on the triangle on the front, and you can see that boardsmanship is the base of that triangle, uh, with student advocacy, innovation, and diversity at the corners, and student success the center part, with uh, service and boardsmanship around the edge. And there's a definition of each of those uh, as our core values. And so what we try to point out to our state coordinators is how does your college measure up with the six core values? How does your college measure up on what you're doing to promote student success? And some of us would maintain it's all in the data. And what kind of data are we collecting about how we have been performing and how are we using that to, to change or adjust our delivery system for effective teaching and learning? And, and I, I believe ACCT nationally is really looking at how do we help colleges collect the right data about student performance and how do we use that to make decisions about improving our delivery systems. So uh, I, I, I'm pleased to uh, attend that. I, I learn a great deal from our, our, our fellow trustees and the annual Congress is coming up in September in Las Vegas and I believe that early day registration is rapidly approaching. I think we've got two or three days left for that and I think a number of you uh, have either indicated you can or you can't go. but. Um, we're trying, to, we're trying to do the best we can to add value of local college membership to ACCT by supporting the two things they're talking about most, measuring student success, advocating for complete degree completion, certification, employment, transfer, and then how do we make trustees better trustees? And a lot of colleges have um, more serious challenges than we have, but uh, again, thank you for the opportunity. Trustee Cross, do you have a question? Yes, Trustee Cook, thank you for, for these presentations. And I, I sit through a number of them, and uh, sometimes I wonder what you're talking about until I pay attention. And I think that you mean to show the impact that we have nationally. And the few ACCT events I've been to, it seems to me that, that there's quite an emphasis, obviously, on student success and achievement, but on preparing trustees for uh, different situations, worse situations than we have, but knowing what's going on. How does our college measure 
um, in terms of transparency, like this administration compared to some other administrations and how they interact with trustees? Well, that's a great question, Trustee Cross. In fact, we had in our board retreat, we had a breakout session dealing with that particular question, uh, one of several questions that we dealt with. And I, I would say that uh, I, I and I, I spoke to this, I, I feel that our trustees understand what we're supposed to be doing. Uh, we have terrific collaboration with our administration. Um, for example, uh, we, we just evaluated our executive director, Noah Brown, as part of our reason for this retreat. And uh, we have now patterned his evaluation pretty much after our evaluation that we have for our president. And the point being that are you evaluating your president on the mission and charge of your college? Are, are, are the expectations you have for your president aligned with the mission, vision, and core values of your college? And so I took time to point out that we have four uh, key areas, uh, actually five, but one of those is the uh, key performance indicators for student success, which breaks down into four. And uh, uh, so, I, I believe we understand what we're supposed to be doing. I believe that as trustees, and I think we're committed to uh, becoming better at that, I think we uh, are professional and respectful about differences of opinion when they occur. But I think it's the trust factor that we have and the commitment we have to help our president be as successful as possible, not absent from evaluating when we believe there may be things that need to improve. So. Maybe a long answer to a very good question, but I think it's the collaboration we have among ourselves and with our administration. Trustee Lindstrom. Uh, I don't have a question, I have a comment. Uh, Trustee Cook, thank you for your extra commi commitment to, uh, to serving on that board as a director. I know, um, I, well, I can only imagine that the, the time and commitment that it takes. Um, let me just say this, that. Uh, Johnson County Community College, this institution, this institution, um, KACCT and ACCT are fortunate to have you serve in that capacity. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I would, I would agree with that. One thing I, I think we also, we not only know, have a pretty good idea of what we should be doing, I think this board has a pretty good idea of what it shouldn't be doing. Um, the nose is in and fingers out rule that we some of us heard about a number of years ago at a retreat is as important, I think, is it's as important to ask questions and to be involved and, and, and know what our that our role is limited to some extent. So all right, uh, Trustee Ingram, are you ready for a foundation report? I am. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the Foundation Executive Committee met in June and the fiscal year 18 foundation operating budget was approved. This budget comes exclusively from a portion of the earnings on foundation funds. This is not supported by and is separate from the college's general fund. In addition to covering operational expenses, $145,000 will be directed to scholarships and program support at Johnson County Community College. That amount is nearly half of the projected budget for fiscal year 18. These funds will supplement the more than $1 million the foundation already awards each year in scholarship funds. As of July 1, the new foundation officers are as follows. President Mary Birch, Lathrop and Gage. Vice President, Suze Parker, Parker Communications. Treasurer, Brian Biggs, Central, Central Bank of the Midwest. Secretary, Dr. Joe Sopchik. Past President, Brad Bergman, Midwest Trust, FCI Advisors. And our Cultural Arts Liaison is Susan Shen of Merck. The fiscal year 18 calendar has been finalized and will be circulated soon to all foundation members and trustee, trustees, and that concludes my report. Questions about the foundation? No tough questions for Kate in the back. All right, thank you. Uh, we're now ready for the consent agenda. Uh, the board's consent agenda includes a number of routine and consensus items that have, are typically considered collectively and approved with a single motion and a single vote. Any member of the board may, requ may request that an item be removed from the consent agenda and um, debated and discussed and voted on separately. Are there any items on today's consent agenda that anybody would like to have considered separately? If not, I'd accept a motion to approve the consent agenda as published. So move. Second. Moved and seconded to approve the consent agenda. All those in favor say yes. Aye. Yes. Aye. Opposed no. Yes, motion carries unanimously. 
Uh, we have no executive session scheduled today, so I'm, uh, I would accept a motion to adjourn. Second. Second. Moved and seconded. All in favor say yes. 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 Those no. Motion carried. Thank you all for coming. Enjoy your summer. <laughs>